الله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله فقال أز وجل في محكم التنزيل وإذ نجيناكم من آل فرعون يسومونكم سوء العذاب يذبهون أبناءكم ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلك بلاء من ربكم عظيم وقال عز وجل وقال الذي اشتراه من مصر لامرأته إكرم أكرم أكرم مثواي عسى أن ينفعنا أو نتخذه ولدا كذلك مكنا ليوسف في الأرض ونعلمه من تعويل الأحاديث والله غالب على أمره ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون إن الحمد لله أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقر دفهم من لساني يفهم قولي اللهم أرنا الحب حقا وذقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وذقنا اجتنابا اللهم ألهمني رشدي وعزني من شبري نفسي Today the topic I want to talk about The title may seem strange Like And that is the Quranic perspective on the Donald Trump phenomenon And For me to talk about this Forget about Donald Trump But we know about the Donald Trump phenomenon One thing I want to introduce you to is one of the unique qualities of the West is, and, and no other civilization has constantly done this, and that is the idea of immigration. Immigration is a uniquely Western idea. And immigration is done for many purposes, including the most important being the brain drain. A lot of the college students have heard of the term brain drain because when they talk about the Greek civilization, they talk about the Roman civilization, they talk about the brain drain, that you take the best brains from around the world and you bring them, you take the best professors, you hire them here. You take the best brains and bring them to NASA, right? You bring the best brains and you bring them to your government. And so that's one of the purposes of why immigration has been so important in the West. This idea of immigration is mentioned in the Quran, particularly in the context of the West. Let me just uh, tell you that there are two prophets, more than two, but two specifically that are main prophets that are prophets of the West because if anyone ever takes a class in Western civilization one of the things you will learn is Western civilization the first civilization you will read about in Western civilization is Egypt have you ever seen the pyramid on the dollar bill anybody ever look at a dollar bill and look at the pyramid Okay, the dollar bill has the pyramid on it. And one of the reasons is that the Western civilization is built on, or built from the time of Egypt. Greece laid its foundations based upon how Egypt was. So we find that the Quran, when it mentions the idea of immigration, it refers to two prophets. Prophet Yusuf, and the story of Yusuf is how they went into Egypt, which is part of Western civilization. And the story of Musa, which is the story of why they left Egypt. And in both the cases, Allah uses a very interesting word. Nothing in Quran is by accident. I think we can agree on this. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Yusuf, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الَّذِي اشْتَرَاهُ And the one who bought him, you know, the, um, the, the, the minister, right? The wazir who had bought Yusuf as a slave, when he brought him as a slave to his home, he said to his wife, لِمِسْرَى لِإِمْرَأَتِهِ He said to his wife, Ikrami, show him generosity. Maybe he will benefit us. We will take Yusuf in, he will benefit us. Or maybe we will take him as a son. We will make him the son of the soil. Or he will benefit us. Labor work is also benefit. We all know the benefit of labor work that comes from the south side. So, the other part of this same ayah, which I will refer to later, but keep this in mind. And this is how we established Yusuf. We established him powerfully on earth. We, he came as an immigrant and he became powerful where he was. And he became powerful. And then the ayah continues. When it mentions Musa والسلام, it says, And the wife of Fir'aun, she said, Do not kill him. Don't kill him. Meaning, the baby is in the river, Musa is in the river. Don't kill him. Maybe he will benefit us. Or we will adopt him as a son. In a time where they were killing the boys. In a time they were killing the boys. Now, I want to make a very, I'm going to say some very interesting things today. Because this is going to be a little bit of a long discussion. But I'm going to say some very interesting things. We are clear that I have mentioned so far. That when Yusuf came in, they said, We will take him in. We will honor him. He will benefit us or we will adopt him as a son of the soil. And Allah said, For the time of Yusuf, And we made him established on earth. The same situation. Similar words, when they were killing the people of Bani Israel. Why? This is what I want to talk about. Why were they killing the boys? And why were they letting the girls live? This is a very important question. And how it relates to today is very important. So, when they, she says, لا تقتله, Don't kill him. Maybe he will benefit us. Or we will adopt him as a son. But the case of Musa was, the demographics had changed, which I will talk about in a second. But I want to show you something very interesting in the Quran before I move forward. In the time of Yusuf والسلام, the leader, the leader in the time of Yusuf, he was called Malik, the king. And in the time of Musa, the leader was called Fir'aun. But you see a lot of interesting things. I'm just going to mention two things, just as an example, because this would be a whole discussion in itself. But when Allah mentions the civilization Yusuf went into, a lot of aspects of Western civilization are men mentioned. A lot of interesting aspects of Western civilization are mentioned. For example, it is a unique feature of Western civilization that they eat in a special way with forks and knives. Right? When the lady said to Yusuf, come and present yourself before the ladies, what had she given them? The knives, right? Sikkim. A uniquely Western way of eating, cutting your food, 
with knives. That's not to say other civilizations do, do it, but I'm saying it's uniquely. When Yusuf saw his brother Binyamin and he wanted to hold him for himself. You know, one of the features of Western civilization is law is very important. And if you're going to do something, you have to do something by the books. Even if you have to find a loophole in the books, you have to do it by the books. So he couldn't. He was not able to take his brother by the law of the king. He couldn't take him. So he had to think of his strategy where he would be able to detain his brother. And then we know what happened, that his brother was detained because of what he had somebody else do. So he had a reason to detain him. He had to follow the law. He had to think of a strategy. So the time of Western civilization is very clear in Sutul Yusuf particularly. I don't have time right now to go through the similarities of Egypt and Greece and how they were similar in uh, in terms of rivers, like they they had the, because Greece is islands. There's the Nile in Egypt, and and how the whole society was copied to a great degree. I don't have time to go into that right now. But the point I'm trying to make is, why in the time of Yusuf, they're saying they take Yusuf in. Yusuf comes into the land, the new land. And Makkanahu fil we established him strongly on earth. And the same civilization is telling Musa and his people, you better go away. Otherwise, we're going to get you. The same people who had the policy of the same people, the same area, it was actually a different dynasty. The first one was Hiskis and then was the Fir'aun. I don't have time to go into that. But there were different, you can say, dynasties. But same civilization. You know, like Roman and Greek, they're part of the same civilization, but different, uh, you know, uh, you can say, dynasties or cultures, but within the same civilization. So, why was it that Allah established the people of Yusuf, Bani Israel, in, in the time and after Yusuf, they became very strong and very prevalent and they were accepted in that society and they were part of that society. And why in the time of Musa والسلام, those same people who had the policy of they were they would let their girls go and be saved, but they would kill their men. Why? Very important question. But before I answer this, I want to answer, I'm going to answer this question first and then the second question, which today's khutbah is essentially around. When Bani Israel, the people of Bani Israel, the people of Yusuf, one of the things happened, and the most important, the most important, that when Yusuf and his brothers were there, they were strong on their deen. They were strong in Islam. They were strong. They were the beginning of Bani Israel. And even though they were immigrants, they were accepted by the people around them. Because when you behave like Yusuf والسلام, and you care about your deen, the, act, the automatic response is you have to get involved. And when you don't care about Islam, you won't be involved and you won't be practicing as a Muslim and you will be like a lot of Muslims are, like we find in Europe, 30% up to 70% of Muslims are the ones that are in jail because of the way they behave. Living on welfare, living on, you know, just not living Islamically, taking advantage of the system. We all know how Muslims sometimes are experts at taking advantage of an honest system. If you will be of those that others see as just an, a parasite on our society, you're just a parasite on our society. You just take advantage of the system. You came from overseas and why are you on welfare? You should be contributing to society as an immigrant. 
When you become a parasite, that means you have lost your deen. Allah has blocked, taken away the honor from you. And then people see you in a negative way. And so when Bani Israel became like a parasite, in the time of Yusuf, they were politically involved. They were active. They were fa'al. They were doing things. They were, they were involved in the society, even though they were different, but they were contributing to society. Because they knew that their Islam and their deen dependent upon this. But when they no longer were contributing to society, then Bani Israel, from that same place, where it was said, يَنْفَعَنَا أَوْ نَتَّخِذُهُ وَلَدًا Maybe he will benefit us or we will take him as a son. That same place was now يُذَبِّهُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَهُمْ They would kill their boys and they would take in their women. This is basically the choice that Muslims that are immigrants they have in the West. First of all, if you are going to be active, you're going to be involved, you're going to be part of society, you're going to contribute positively to society, Allah will honor you. But if you don't contribute to society, if you're just going to be a parasite, if you're just going to take advantage of the system and you're not honest, and you're not people others can trust, and, and you're just creating your own cliques and gangs and not being because da'wah is part of what? A ta'aruf qabla da'wah. You have, people have to get to know you before da'wah. People have to get to know you before you can do da'wah. You can't tell people to come to Islam if they don't even know who you are. How are you going to introduce them to Islam if they don't know who you are? Da'wah, you know, in one way, da'wah is the best politics. Why? Because politics, the essence of politics is changing minds and hearts of people, right? That's the purpose of being politically involved, is to change the hearts and the minds of the people. When you do da'wah, when you introduce them to Islam, you are changing their hearts and minds par excellence. It is not electoral politics, but it is politics. Da'wah is politics. You know, one of the uh, things I was talking about, Western civilizations, one of the interesting correlations between Yusuf being in the West and we being in the West, one of the interesting correlations, besides yanfa'ana aw nattakhiduhu walada, is that Yusuf did da'wah where? In jail, remember? And where is Islam most prominently growing today in the West? It's in the prison systems. It's in the prison system. Everyone becomes Muslim in jail, every day, every day, every day. In my high school years, I used to work with, uh, there was an imam, very famous imam in Chicago, Imam Firdosi. He had an organization called Islamic Correctional Union Association Islamic. We used to get letters from people in prison. Like I, I did this for like four, five, six years. Every day after high school, I would go and get the letters from all over the, the country. And we would give them Islamic literature. We would answer their questions. We would, you know, just every day I did this for three, four hours, every single day after high school, almost, you know, you know, there were maybe some days I didn't, obviously, but most of the days I spent my time over there in the high school days, from Monday through Friday. But I saw how much interest there was for Islam in the prison system. Anyway, that point aside, I was only making one point right now out of the three points I wanted to make. Time is running out. The first point was that the same people who had the policy of the West, even though there were different civilizations, one was Hiskis, was Fir'aun, one was Fir'aun. Yanfa'ana aw nattakhiduhu walada. In the time of Yusuf, makkannahu fil awd. We made him strong on earth. And in the time of Musa, la taqtilhu. Yanfa'ana aw nattakhiduhu walada. Same Western people saying we will adopt him as the son of the soil. But their policy became killing their boys and letting their girls go. I'm going to talk about this as a very important point. Now how this relates to Donald Trump is the second point that I want to discuss. You see that there were two tribes 
two big tribes. There was the Ibti tribe. Now I'm talking about in the time of Musa. What had changed? When Yusuf had first gone into the Hiskis dynasty, when Yusuf had been established, they were a small community. There were, tw there were 12 brothers, right? And they were small. They were not a threat to anyone. But by the time the Fir'auns had come, the population of the Bani Israel had exceeded or was beginning to exceed the Qibti tribe. So there was an effort that if the Muslims, if the Bani Israel will become too much, if they become, if the demographics change so much that what was the majority will end up becoming the minority, then there was a reaction to that. And the reaction was, the policy was, يَقْتُلُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَهُمْ We will kill their sons. And by the way, here, just as a side point, Harun alayhi salatu wasalam, he was older than Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Harun was older. Harun survived because he was born in a year that they had not made this policy. They had not come out with this policy yet. But by the time of Musa والسلام, they had come out with this policy that because the demographics are changing and the majority is going to soon become the minority, then you have to do social engineering and you have to do population control. This is the second point. So what's happening with the Donald Trump phenomenon is very simple. The demographics are changing, and you can take this not specific to Western civilization, but generally with the demographics will change, a phenomenon as a reaction to that will naturally happen. And that is what's happening. So Donald Trump is not the first or the last of this. He is just one probably in a series of people that will try to try to control and to, 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 to come out with ideas of social engineering or ideas of even if you can go as crazy as saying eugenics in some sorts of trying to contain things as they are. But the reality is that Allah is always changing things. This is the reality. But now I want to talk about a third aspect. And this will be maybe the hardest to understand. The first point I made that when Yusuf came into Egypt, he was welcomed and he grew because they were strong in Islam. Yusuf and his brothers. And then Allah was punishing them by the time that Bani Israel had become weak. It had become so weak that they had basically, even though, this is interesting, even though Bani Israel, the children at the time of Musa, they had adopted all of the cultural norms. They had adopted all the cultural norms of the Fir'aun civilization. But they were still being persecuted. So this was my first point. Second point was the change in demographics. The third point, which is why, why Please understand this. I mean, I don't have time. I once gave a lecture on this, a lengthy lecture. I think I talked just on this issue for more than like an hour and a half. And people were like, wow, wow, this is amazing. This is there in the Quran. I'm going to give you one sample of history before we talk about today and what's happening today. Let's talk about something that already happened. So, the example that I'm going to give is, and you will then understand why France is so much against hijab. There is an idea, hospitals and jails have one thing in common, that they have a uh, what we call a panopticon middle shape. The nurses are in the center and all the rooms are around the center. Okay? And in the jail also the same thing happens. The ability, listen to what I'm about to say. The ability to see others 
when others are not able to see you. Keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. Now I'm going to share with you something. When the French went to Algeria, what did they see as their biggest obstacle? Their biggest obstacle. How can we colonize the Algerians when they went to Algeria? This, I'm giving you a sample of history. When they went to Algeria, what was the number one obstacle that they saw that when they're looking at a society, a civilization, the Algerian people, they're like, okay, we have to colonize these people. How are we going to, we physically, we're militarily there. We already occupied the land. But how are we going to really get into their minds and their souls? Do you know what the discussion was? Do you know what the end result of the discussion was? I'm going to share that with you. This was the political doctrine. The doctrine was, if we want to destroy the structure of Algerian society, its capacity for resistance, we must first of all conquer the women. We must go and find them behind the veil where they hide themselves. They want to save the women. This is what the idea today is happening, intentionally or unintentionally. Oh, we want to save the Muslim women. That's why when a non-Muslim asks you questions, 50% of the questions have to do with women. Because that's what they're trying to say. We're trying to save the Muslim women. And then who is left? It's the Muslim men who are the target. <coughs> this is how social engineering takes place. So the general who was the strongest masculine voice of his time, he says, if we want to destroy the structure of Algerian society, its capacity for resistance, we must first of all conquer the women. We must go and find them behind the veil where they hide themselves and in the houses where they keep, where men keep them out of sight. This, and then he says, well, I won't go into what other things he said. Well, maybe, okay. So General Eugene, who was the strongest voice of his time, and today there are other such similar voices in France, particularly, who carry the idea of General Eugene. That if we want to change Muslim civilization, their way of thinking, it is not possible to change their way of thinking until we change their women. This is the idea. Because women represent culture. What is culture? Language. What is culture? Food. What is culture? The way you live, your lifestyle. It's what you do in your house. That is culture. If you want to change a civilization, you cannot change a civilization without first changing the women. This is what you have to explain to your daughters. That you are the number one target. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said there will come a time who will be the most attracted to the jad and his call? Will be the sisters, will be the mothers. The Prophet said, a mu'min brother will try to tie down his mother and his sister from going out to the jad. They essentially kill the men and try to save the women. What did they do to the African American community? Same thing. Put all the men, 30% of African Americans are in jail. And most of the jobs are given to the women. Kill the civilization. Kill the people. Make them into animals. If you want to destroy a civilization, you have to get to their women and change the way that they behave. Without that, you can't do it. And therefore, you will always find, you will always find, you will always find the number one attacking point when it comes to Islam and the Muslim civilization will, <coughs> will always be how can we get the women to change? Even if it's a Mordi Saab and he starts, you know, playing with the Quran and playing with the Sunnah, that's one way. And I don't want to go into details about this, but everybody understands what I'm trying to say. Uh, time is running out. Inshallah, we do the second khutbah. <laughs> In 
الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Let me just summarize what I said But before I forget I want to mention there is the Iqna convention happening I really recommend every Muslim go if a lot of you have never